All right, Alexander, let's uh, talk about escalation with, uh, with China, between the U.S. and China. What is, uh, is going on here? Well, we, we've now had this uh, report, this memo that was circulated by G uh, General Minihan, who is a U.S. military officer, very senior military officer, Air Force General. He's apparently in charge of transport and logistics for the U.S. military. And he's talking about a war with China between the United States and China, you know, direct shooting war between the two over Taiwan, breaking out within two years, in 2025. And um, apparently there's other American, senior American officers, Navy people principally, but some military people, uh, you know, ar ar army people too. They're also talking about war with China. Uh, 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 and I think it was an Admiral Davidson said by 2027. But all of the indications are, all of the actions that the US military is taking in the Pacific. Now point clearly to the United States preparing for an armed conflict with China sometime later this decade. Now I have to say that makes my, I mean that chills me, <laughs> but apparently that is what some people are now preparing. It's not just Ukraine all over again, it's Ukraine all over again multiplied by a hundred. Why? Why are they? Why? Why are they? Do they feel the need to do this? I mean, what's what, what's the reasoning? Right. Well, this? I, th I think there's two levels of reasoning. Firstly, there's the military people, the people in the, um, uh, you know, the naval leadership, and I think here we go all the way back to a memo that uh, Douglas MacArthur uh, wrote. I think way back in 1950 or thereabouts, he said that. Taiwan is absolutely essential for the U.S. position in the Pacific. If Taiwan were ever to be occupied or taken over or united to the mainland by the Chinese, the United States would have at their disposal an unsinkable aircraft carrier from which they would be able to dominate the whole of the Central Pacific region and American military positions across the Pacific would be severely undermined and that the US ability to dominate the Pacific and to treat the Pacific as a kind of gigantic American lake, which has been largely the case since the end of the Second World War, that would be over. So, you know, there's a military logic to this, that whether that's a logic that justifies Risking war with China is another matter. But there's also, of course, a political logic. And there's a, the political logic is in two parts. Firstly, I think there is genuine sentiment on the part of some people in the United States in favour of Taiwan. I mean, Taiwan is a country with which the United States has had very close relations now for a very long time. I say a country, but of course, the Chinese deny that it's a country. But, you know, I'm going to call it a country for the for simplicity's sake in this program. So there is, I think, genuine fellow feeling from Taiwan. It's a democracy, it's a capitalist country, it's economically successful, it's been a friend of the United States. The United States has been a friend of Taiwan. There's a certain genuine sentiment about Taiwan. I have to say, though, I think overall the big story here is that there's a very powerful feeling in the United States that China is the US's great adversary, that it's now the first country since way back in you know, the 19th century to equal the US in economic power or threaten to do so, that it's becoming a rising military power. And it's seen as a challenge to the US. It's got a political system completely different from that of the US. It's seen as ta having taken advantage of the US economically. There's been a long article in, I think, NBC, saying that China took advantage of the way the US was focused on the war on terror in the 2000s to you know, build up its power. And I think there is a feeling in the United, among some people in the United States 
especially the military, that China needs to be beaten down. It's a challenge that needs to be beaten down and defeated. And the result of all of this, all of these three strands, is that we seem to be working towards a head-on clash with China, which I want to say straight away, I think would be a disaster. It wouldn't be good for China. But it'd be very, very bad indeed for the United States. Yeah, but the United States, has, as long as they are committed in Ukraine, they're becoming weaker. And China is, in, in my opinion, they, they have, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to say they've benefited from, from everything that has taken place in Ukraine, but this has in a way worked to their advantage from multiple uh, yeah. aspects. They've, they've been able to see, you know, what, what the tactics are of, uh, of NATO, the U.S. and the collective West with Ukraine. They have, uh, they have been able to, to take advantage of the fact that the collective West is, to a certain degree, bogged down in, uh, in Ukraine. They're pouring in more and more weapons. I'm sure the Chinese have been studying those weapons. They're seeing what's going on on the battlefield. They've been able to see how the collective West uses sanctions, and I'm sure they're now calibrating their economy to deal with that as well. Um, you know, they understand which countries are aligned with with the dictates of Washington, which is pretty much all of the, the European nations. So I'm sure they're expecting that if something goes down, they're also going to to have those countries align against against China. So, I mean, China has has seen what's going on in Ukraine, and I'm sure they've they've said to themselves, OK, we have a picture as to how as to what the United States and U.S. Uh, subordinates are going to do if they do make a move on Taiwan, so now we can we can prepare accordingly. Meanwhile, the, the United States is is throwing money and weapons and everything they have into Ukraine, and this is weakening the, the U.S. military. So how, the, how, how do they see themselves as pulling this off as long as they're they're committed in Ukraine? They I think that's exactly that is exactly that is precisely correct. I talked about this in a big article. I think it's in NBC about how. Um, there are some people in the United States who think that China took advantage of the war on terror to build up its power as the United States was distracted by the war on terror, by a, you know, a, sh a sideshow. I mean, if that is true, and I think to some extent it is true, how much bigger a distraction is the conflict in Ukraine? I mean, the, the United States is burning through its weapon stocks its money, its resources far more rapidly in Ukraine than it ever did at any point in time during the war on terror. So uh, from a, a Chinese point of view, this is a gift. This war on Ukraine is a gift that just goes on giving. And you're quite right. They are getting lots of technology. It turns out, I was reading somewhere, that the United States um, has been relying on high mass systems, being uh, many of islands, basing them in various islands to sort of launch strikes on uh, Chinese ships and amphibious ships and all that kind of thing. Well, the Russians have now captured intact high mass missiles. They've taken them apart. They're, of course, sharing all the technology with the Chinese. They're going to be sharing technology about everything else, about M777 howitzers, about Bradley infantry fighting vehicles when they turn up. They're already... Uh, 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 giving bonuses, offering bonuses to people who get hold of Abrams tanks. They they know all about the counter battery radars, as you rightly say. They're keeping an eye on what the you know the American radar and satellite systems are doing. They figuring out how all of that works, and they're giving all that information to the Chinese, and the Chinese are studying all that themselves. So, from the Chinese point of view, this is this is perfect. This is exactly what they want. They want the United States tied up far away in Europe in an endless, protracted, unwinnable war in Europe, one which, by the way, binds Russia even more closely to China. And there's reports this morning that Xi Jinping is now in the final stages of preparing his trip to Moscow. So that's coming very soon, it seems. So the Chinese are very happy with this. It's playing out perfectly from their point of view in almost every respect. And 
there must be some people in Washington who are worried about that. And of course, you can see that some people in Washington, in the Pentagon, in the military industrial complex, in some of the think tanks around the CSIS are saying, let's terminate this affair in Ukraine as quickly as we can so we can focus on the struggle that really matters, which is the one against China. And of course, I'm sure that there are still some voices in the US which say, look, this is going too far altogether. We can't realistically get drawn into a conflict in China. That would be a disaster for us. And that's certainly how I think about it. Yeah, the, the, the Chinese are also benefiting from the, uh, the, the disaster on a reputational diplomatic level for for the United States as well. I mean, you know, the de-dollarization, yeah, the fact yeah. that, uh, the, that the U.S. has imposed so many sanctions, the seizing of assets, the freezing of, uh, of uh, foreign reserves, uh, the booting uh, out of SWIFT of Russia. I mean, other countries in the world are looking at this and they're saying, well, what other options do we have? And China is saying, well, we can provide you with options. Excellent. And so this is also you know, hurting, hurting the U.S.'s ability to take on China from that aspect as well. Absolutely. And, I mean, the, and you're... the, the no, no, I just want to say the U.S. is so is so deep into Ukraine now. They've committed themselves so deeply into Ukraine that even a quick pullout, like you said, would have big time political consequences. And, and, and you know, the world is going to look at the United States in a different way if they just say, you know, we're pulling out of Ukraine, the world's going to say, OK, well, you really are not as as strong as as, you know, you we thought you weren't. And the sanctions really aren't as uh, as devastating as as you portray them to be, because look at Russia. Russia took all your blows and came out on top. This is I mean, exactly, they really, they've really maneuvered themselves into a corner. This is exactly true. This is exactly correct. I mean, bear in mind that most of the global south has basically aligned with Russia on this one. I mean, Brazil has just announced that they're not supplying weapons to Germany because they're afraid those weapons will go to Ukraine, you know, ammunition and things of that kind. So, I mean, and across the global south, we see, you know, South Africa, BRICS member state lays out the red carpet for Lavrov. We see Lavrov going to Angola. All important. But of course, much bigger, much more important in terms of this conflict, we see the Chinese going to Saudi Arabia. They're cutting big deals now with the Saudis. They're cutting big deals now with the Iranians. They're cutting big deals with the Turks. They're involved in all sorts of things. They are capitalizing on the fact that the US is overcommitted to Ukraine. As you said, it suffered already severe reputational damage and it's exposed the fact that his great sanctions bazooka doesn't work in the way that the US thought it did. It didn't level Russia. Russia's come through and the US attempt to stop Russian oil exports, that's failing as well. The US attempt to stop Russian gas exports is failing as well. The Russians are doing a deal with Pakistan on energy supplies. All over the world, people are making those coming to those conclusions. And as you rightly say, the Chinese are able to do that which the Soviets never could, which is offer people around the world attractive alternatives. You don't have to use the dollar. We're coming up with our own reserve currency. You don't have to use the swift messaging system, which the Americans control. We're coming up with alternatives. We, you don't have to go to the IMF. We are there to lend you money. You can do it. We can lend you money in, your, in, in dollars or euros if you want, but we can also lend you money, firstly, in our own currency, and then eventually in this reserve currency when you want it. And if you want to float your companies, you can do it on our stock exchanges. And if you want uh, um, other financial services, we've got the whole range of them. We can offer you credit cards. We can offer you whatever you like, we can give it. 
an election is coming up in the U.S. in a little less than uh, two years. Trump is already uh, campaigning. It seems like he's already campaigning. What, uh, what does the next administration have to do in order to get out of this mess that the Biden, that the Biden administration has put the United States into? Well, the first thing it must do is, is come to some kind of modus vivendi with the Russians. Easier said than done, given how much damage has been done and how deeply suspicious the Russians are of everybody, both in the US and Europe now. But I will say that there is one thing that the US does have going for it, which is the Russians are much more angry with the Europeans than they are with the US. And I think they might just be willing to come to some sort of modus vivendi with the Americans. We wouldn't have a restoration of trust. We wouldn't have a situation going back to what we saw you know, in the early 2000s when Putin was wanting to be friends with the US, but I don't think the Russians still want to be locked in an indefinite confrontation with the US. And I think if the Americans say to the Russians, look, we do understand this whole business with Ukraine was a disaster and a debacle. You can have Ukraine and what's left of it. Uh, we're not going to try and overthrow your government. We're not going to we're going to ease all the sanctions that we've imposed on you in return. You know, don't meddle in our European backyard. I think there may be some people in Moscow who will say, fair enough. We won't really start things in, say, Bulgaria or the Balkans or wherever. We can agree some kind of a ceasefire, if you like, with the US in that way. We will never restore our relations with the Europeans, but with the US, we could put together some kind of dialogue. That is the first thing. The second thing that the United States needs to do, and I think this is very important, they need to try and get off the escalation ladder with China. They need to say to the Chinese, look, when we say that we accept the one China policy, we mean it. We were not going to try and create a military crisis in the Pacific. Uh, you say that you don't want to take over Taiwan by force. You want a peaceful reunification, provided you continue with that. We are prepared to go back to the situation that it was before the Biden administration came in. And, you know, we will look the other way. You will look the other way. Taiwan can continue as it was. Hopefully, at some point in the future, relations between Taiwan and yourselves will be sorted out peacefully. We will maintain our economic relationship with Taiwan, but we're not looking to militarize this any longer. And at the same time, we're going to start dismantling all these structures like AUKUS and all of that, which we built in that sort of way. That's the second thing I would do. And the third thing I would do, because the United States does, in my opinion, have legitimate grievances against China, but they are of an economic nature. I would start to, I would continue to do what Donald Trump, the Trump administration was doing in the first two years, in his first two years, which is start to place restrictions on Chinese imports. And I would work very hard to, to try to rebuild the US manufacturing base. In other words, I would focus on strengthening the United States. I think if this was done in a purposeful way, if an administration, a strong administration, was prepared to face down all these competing interest groups that exist in the United States and which are so dominant in the Democratic Party and among the rhinos and all those sort of people. I think a reindustrialization re program in the United States is possible. In fact, I'm, I'm sure it would succeed. But that would be the priority. And then very rapidly, five, ten years' time, You'd have a United States, which is in a much stronger position to compete with China where it matters, which is in economics, in industry, in trade, in commerce and in all of those things. And I still think that if it does that, 
and it you know doesn't seek to reduce everything to military confrontation competition and conflict i still think that for most people around the world the american political system and its social system and how it's organized are more attractive at the end of the day than the chinese one but that's what I would advise the U.S. to do, <laughs> not what the U neocons want. And that's the fundamental problem. The neocons see everything yeah, a three as a kind of chess game. And I think that's a fundamental mistake. Yeah, and they're not good at chess. <laughs> they're and not they're very good, good at, at what they do. No. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. A, a three-point plan that hopefully the, the next administration uh, takes up. Yes. The Biden administration, they will never do what uh, what you just laid out, Alexander, that's for sure. Yes. They're going to do but the exact been, opposite of everything you said. But it's been done before. I mean, back in the 60s, you know, Nixon and Kissinger, appalling people, though they were, they were sufficiently realistic to do something like this. So they uh, uh, pursued Tant with the Soviets. They agreed arms limitation with the Soviets. They came to all kinds of agreements with the Soviets and they opened up to China. And the result was after the Vietnam War, they bought the United States the time and the space to reorganize and to come back, which the United States did. <laughs> so that worked then, perhaps it can work again, at least to me. That's the obvious way forward. This constant confronting everybody everywhere all the time, I think it's a policy that is going to fail. I'm, fa I'm sure it is. Yeah, well, it's failing. It's failing. It's failing. It's, not, it's, failing. it's, it's failing. It's failing. You know, I'm sure it is. It is failing. It's and failing. it's failing fast. And it's failing fast. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, we will leave it there at Duran.locals.com. We are also on Rockfin and go to the Duran shop, 10% off, use the code GOODDAY. Take care.